Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the American Academy for Official Pain webinar series. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, a great speaker and I'll introduce her a little bit. Uh, now, just for housekeeping, uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, use the Q&A uh, option. Don't uh, use chat option. Uh, this will help us to uh, get uh, to your questions. Uh, with me, uh, Dr. Connor Peck, he's uh, part of the webinar committee, and he will also screen the, the questions and ask Dr. Matthew. Uh, first of all, let me introduce Dr. Paul Matthew. He's an MD neurologist. He has a lot of uh, degrees and uh, titles uh, under his belt. Uh, the more important is he's one of the top uh, neurologists, headache uh, neurologists, in town. He is, um, as I said, his CV or his biography is really too long and I'm trying rapidly to uh, make it very short. He graduated from a uh, uh, residency program in neurology at the Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia and then completed a fellowship in uh, headache medicine in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He is a board certified in neurology and headache medicine. He is currently an associate assistant professor in neurology at Harvard Medical School and an affiliate member of HMS uh, Division of Sleep Medicine. So he knows it all. Uh, he has a clinical appointment at Mass General Brigham uh, Health and Harvard uh, Vanguard Medical Associates. Uh, um, in terms of his academic responsibilities, he has uh, involved in education of countless neurology, psychiatry, internal medicine, family medicine, dental medicine. Uh, by the way, his wife is a dentist, so this is plus a uh, finger up for him. Uh, he has written more than 90 uh, publications and has uh, presented at both national and international conferences. I met him a few times in different meetings. He's a dynamic speaker. Uh, he's uh, involved with uh, lobbying for headaches, uh, for headache patients in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm trying to make it short, Paul, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, Gabby, that's more than enough. You've already put um, the audience. So I, I'd really like to welcome you for uh, for this presentation. Uh, I think it's very important for us as oral facial pain dentists uh, to know more about the cervical headache and any other headaches related to cervical and, and uh, headaches in general. Thank you very much. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Yeah, so Gabby, uh, thank you for that long-winded introduction. Uh, hopefully I can get people awake again. And I do appreciate the promotion from assistant to associate. I should have you introduce me more often. Maybe I'll be full professor in a year. Um, so this is really one of my big passions uh, in terms of areas of interest for research and, and uh, clinical practice, really differentiating how the neck and headache disorders intervene. And uh, hopefully I give you some unique perspectives that you really won't find in textbooks just from clinical experience, but also some of the published literature. So uh, just some financial disclosures, which really are not relevant to this presentation. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, ICHD classification of headache disorders. Um, effective treatment plans for the different disorders that we're going to be talking about today, and protocols for treating neck pain when associated with headache. So this is a Venn diagram that really will kind of serve as a guide and a table of contents for today's talk. Uh, as most of you know, C2 and C3 are kind of the epicenter of where headache and neck pain meet. And there's three diagnoses that I'm really going to focus on. And as you can see, they're in different colors, and they are kind of mesh in the middle because there is quite a bit of gray area in clinical practice. And oftentimes patients get misdiagnosed and are inappropriately assigned one of these diagnoses when they have one of the other. So there's cervicogenic headache, occipital neuralgia, and then primary headache associated with central sensitization. Although that's not a category in the ICHD3, uh, it is certainly something that we see in clinical practice quite a bit. Now, these are not terms I really use, so I'm going to shift them a little bit. And so cervicogenic headache, many of you know, is kind of this wastebasket diagnosis where anybody with headache and neck pain gets thrown into, and there's really no differentiation. 
So I actually divide this into migraine with cervicogenic features and tension type headache with cervicogenic features because the vast majority of patients will get into this, have a history of migraine or tension type headache, and then at some point they develop some cervical pathology and then they get thrown into this wastebasket diagnosis of cervicogenic headache. The other modification I'm going to make is primary headache associated with central sensitization, uh, neck pain. I'm going to call this migranous cervicalgia for the purposes of this lecture. And again, we're going to delve into all three of these to varying extents, spending the most time on occipital neuralgia, but also a little bit of time on the other two. And again, C2, C3 is really the origin where a lot, all, all three of these can really originate from. So we're going to start with migraine with cervicogenic features and tension type headache with cervicogenic features. So um, this is the ICHD3 criteria. So cervicogenic headache, uh, basically, this is a headache where there's clinical or imaging evidence that there's a disorder or lesion within the cervical spine or soft tissues of the neck known to be a cause of headache. Um, and evidence of this has to be two of the following features. It develops in temporal relation to developing that cervical disorder or appearance of the lesion. So again, many of these people have a history of tension type headache or a history of migraine, then this pathology develops, and now magically they lose the diagnosis of migraine or tension type headache, and they're called cervicogenic headache. I say my, magically a little facetiously, because again, they don't lose that primary headache disorder, they just develop this neck issue that's now exacerbating that primary headache disorder. So headache has significantly improved or resolved in parallel with improvement or resolution of the cervical disorder or lesion. So again, you treat the neck pain, they kind of revert back to that episodic tension type or episodic migraine phenotype. Uh, and it's abolished with blockade of the cervical structures or nerve supply. So it kind of points in that direction. So in regards to cervicogenic headache, uh, imaging findings in the upper cervical spine are common in many patients with headache. As many of the seasoned clinicians on the line know, you don't treat the imaging study, you treat the patient, right? And so we'll often see patients who have horrible looking uh, radiological findings and really benign, mild uh, clinical presentation. And then on the other hand, people who have really, really tough clinical presentations with severe intensity pain and really minimal radiographic lesion. So again, our imaging study should really complement the clinical picture that we get from the history and from the physical exam. Um, so those are the first two bullets. Uh, tumors, fractures, infections, and arthritis can certainly all contribute to cervicogenic features or cervicogenic headaches. So if those things are present, you may want to think, okay, is there a cervicogenic irritant or trigger to these headaches? And, and again, um, like I said, C2, C3, the trigeminal uh, nucleus caudalis, these are where there's really an interface between um, the uh, cervical and the cranial inputs. So according to the ICHD3, things that favor cervicogenic headache over migraine or tension type headache, and this is in the ICHD3, uh, side lock pain. So if it's side lock pain, you really want to think about cervicogenic headache according to the ICHD3, but that doesn't really make sense, right? Because migraine, according to the ACHD, is a headache that tends to have a dominant side or a side lock side. So that really doesn't hold much water. Provocation of typical headache by digital pressure on neck muscles or by head movement. So again, I think this kind of accentuates the point that when you irritate that neck pain, it triggers their primary headache disorder and a posterior to anterior radiation of the pain. Again, very nonspecific. And this is quoting the ICHD3, migranous features such as nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and phonophobia may be present with cervicogenic headache. So again, as far as I'm concerned, this is migraine with cervicogenic features, creating a whole new bucket diagnosis for cervicogenic headache really doesn't make sense. And really, that's not how I identify them, because at the end of the day, you end up treating their cervical pathology, but many of these patients do benefit from being on migraine-specific treatments as well. So I don't want to dwell on cervicogenic headache too much, because again, it does end up being kind of a waste uh, basket diagnosis. And we're going to get to it again when we do our wrap-up at the end of this lecture. So occipital neuralgia is where we're going to be spending more of our time. So occipital neuralgia, as many of you know, with any neuralgia, these are lancinating stabs of pain lasting seconds at a time. Uh, it can be in the greater, lesser, or third occipital nerve distributions. So just like any neuralgia, recurring paroxysm of pain lasting seconds at a time, uh, severe intensity, shooting, stabbing, jolting quality. 
Um, the pain often is accompanied by dysesthesia or allodynia. Someone with bad occipital neuralgia, you even touch the scalp, they'll say that's kind of uncomfortable because, again, that's an irritated nerve. Tenderness over the affected branches um, and trigger points or nerve blocks will typically resolve the pain, and that's part of the diagnostic criteria. So for those of you in clinical practice that perform occipital nerve blocks for the treatment of occipital neuralgia, it is absurd and completely incoherent that insurance companies deny occipital nerve blocks for the treatment of occipital neuralgia because it is part of the diagnostic criteria. That would be like somebody coming in with chest pain and saying, we're not going to pay for the EKG. Uh, obviously, that's an important part of the diagnosis, as is response to occipital nerve blocks for occipital neuralgia. So uh, one maneuver that's very useful in clinical practice is in occipital tunnels. Some of you may remember in your training a tunnel sign in the wrist for carpal tunnel syndrome. So in occipital tunnels, you tap from the inion across to the mastoid. When you hit just the right spot, the patient will typically wince in pain. And when you ask them, do you have pain where I tapped? Yes. Do you also have pain higher up in the back of the head? Yes. That's a positive tunnels. So somebody with just garden variety migraine or a neck problem may have some palpation or percussion pain locally, but that should not radiate to pain up above. Uh, so with a positive tunnels in the occiput, you really want to look for that radiation of either pain or paresthesias along the distribution of the affected nerve. Again, whether that's the greater, third, or lesser occipital nerves. Also, many of these patients, when you do the range of motion, when you get to the end stage of rotation or flexion extension, a lot of the time they'll say that reproduces the pain as well, depending on how intense the pain is. And when patients ask me, I tell them that nerve exits from your neck, runs through muscle, ligaments, and connective tissue, twists, and goes up the back of the head. So patients will often ask, you know, how did I get this? commonly a sports injury, a whiplash injury, car accident, but also occupational hazards. People that do a lot of computer work over years or even decades in this kind of anterior hunch position, it does irritate those nerves and people can develop occipital neuralgia. And commonly, as you can see in the last line of this slide, these patients will come in saying, I have headaches and I've had pains. I know I might sound crazy, uh, but this is where you could very quickly step in and say, you know, we treat patients with headache and neck pain all the time. And commonly, you know, I will tell patients, no, I completely get it. There's a difference between headache and head pain. And when you explain migraine versus occipital neuralgia, it all does make sense to the patient as well. So as I gained interest in this subject, um, I did a literature search and I found this, which was published back in 2015, uh, sorry, in um, 2011, this was a study conducted at the University of Southern California where they looked at 35 patients that presented with occipital neuralgia. And of those 35 patients, 15 of them had both occipital neuralgia and migraine. And this makes sense. Uh, a lot of the patients that we see in clinical practice, typically they'll have a story of, you know, doctor, uh, I've had episodic migraine my whole life. But around the age of 40 or so, they start to become much more frequent, much more severe. And instead of starting around the eye, they started to uh, begin around the back of the head. And then when you take a careful history, they will detail two different types of pain, occipital neuralgia and migraine. And some of them, you, you can really blow their mind and they'll say, so let me guess, you have some neck pain, you have this shooting, stabbing pain, eventually it becomes a steady achy pain with jolts on top of it, which is common for neuralgias, including trigeminal neuralgia. And then when that pain gets bad enough, you'll then start to get light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, and a throbbing, pounding headache. And they'll say, that's exactly what happens, doctor. And then you explain to them, your neuralgia activates, and then when it gets bad enough, it hits a certain threshold, triggering the migraine to occur. Unfortunately, many of these patients, when they see uh, a dentist or physician, they'll say light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, nausea, and throbbing headache, and immediately everybody pounces on, this must be migraine, let me treat this as if it were migraine, when again, they're missing half of the picture. So as I gained interest in this subject, um, you know, serendipity happened, an eager medical student said, Dr. Matthew, I'd like to work on some research with you. So we looked at 800 consecutive patients that presented to um, the Cambridge Health Alliance headache clinic. So again, this is not the Mass General Brigham where it's a regional encatchment. This is a local encatchment. And these were 800 patients complaining of just garden variety headache, no specific diagnosis. Of them, 648 of them were women. And out of those 800 patients, 195 of them had a concomitant diagnosis of occipital neuralgia. 
So if you look at the numbers, that's about 25% of patients presenting to a headache clinic uh, have occipital neuralgia in addition to their other primary headache disorder. Without surprise, the most common was chronic migraine. And in this study, we found that about 75% of the patients with occipital neuralgia actually had a positive occipital tunnel sign. So an occipital tunnel sign can be very useful for helping to confirm the diagnosis, but it also reinforces to the patient, this is the pathology when I tap there, this is why it happens, and really explaining to patients why uh, things happen from a clinical perspective is very useful for them to understand their own diagnoses. And when that happens, the educated patient is the one that's going to be more compliant with your treatment recommendations. So in addition, we also found that uh, there was a correlation, not only with chronic migraine, but also elevated body mass index and higher age of presentation. Um, so it was these older patients that had a higher BMI that were more likely to have concomitant occipital neuralgia, which again makes sense when you think about body habitus and how people over years and decades do practice poor posture, which can put strain on the occipital nerves. So neurologists in general, like really punny titles. So the abstract title was the diagnosis in the back of your head, kind of like this presentation, the prevalence of occipital neuralgia in a community hospital-based headache clinic. So nerve blocks, as I mentioned earlier, are part of the diagnostic criteria for occipital neuralgia. They're generally safe, well-tolerated in-office procedures. Uh, they can be performed in patients who are having acute pain of many different types. Uh, in my practice, if somebody is having a seven or greater intensity pain, and as time permits, I will sometimes offer trigeminal blocks or occipital blocks, regardless of diagnosis, just to give them some relief in the office. Um, but uh, some um, nerve blocks do provide a longer duration of benefit than the anesthetic. Uh, I typically use bupivacaine just because it does have a longer time of action. Um, but as we will get to, um, some of these blocks do quite uh, last significantly longer. So blocks can be done, uh, performed with or without steroid really across the board. The only time that in headache medicine, we almost universally include steroid is with occipital nerve blocks for the treatment of cluster headache. Um, with anesthetics, there's lidocaine, bupivacaine, or oftentimes people do a combination. Like I said, if I'm going in to do a nerve block with the intent of long-lasting relief, I do like 0.75% bupivacaine, but certainly you can do whatever you feel comfortable with. For cluster headache, steroids alone have been proven to be useful. So that further reinforces for that particular indication, um, including steroids makes sense. Um, as all of you know, if you are including steroids, you want to be careful in patients who have Cushing syndrome, glaucoma, uh, cutaneous atrophy, and alopecia um, are also problematic. I'll never forget, I saw a young lady in her 20s, and when she came to see me, she had four dime-sized divots in her forehead, and I had to ask what happened, and she said, oh, the doctor I saw before you performed uh, some nerve blocks, and I asked, did you use steroid? And she said, yes. So this poor 20-year-old had this disfigurement that um, you know lasted probably about six to eight months before the skin started to recover from the steroid application. And when I reached out to the pain doctor that performed the injections, um, he kind of cavalierly said, well, that's just a, a normal complication of doing the injection. So I caution everybody, if you are going to use steroid, make sure it's in an area that's not cosmetic, like in the face, uh, or an area that's not easily hid by the hairline. Um, so when I perform occipital nerve blocks, I like to put the patient in the prone position uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, if they're prone, they're not going to see the needle. Uh, number two, if uh, they get very faint from uh, the procedure, they're already prone, so they're not going to fall very far. Um, with auricular temporal, supraorbital, and supratrochlear, typically I'll have them supine. Um, and again, the reason to have patients lying down, it does improve patient tolerance. Uh, it reduces provider fatigue. So you always want to be in a comfortable position yourself when you're doing these procedures. And I know some people do occipital nerve blocks with the patient sitting with their arms down like this. My concern is if you're sitting, there's more uh, an increased likelihood of the head moving. Uh, and the worst thing to have is a needle in someone's head and then their head starts moving. So stability is really important. So... Reasons to perform nerve blocks, if a patient is having neuralgia form pain in a single nerve distribution, like occipital neuralgia, it makes a lot of sense. In cervicogenic headache, it's not really isolated to a particular distribution, although it may still be helpful for the patient uh, in terms of giving them some pain relief, it may not have the yield that occipital neuralgia has. 
Uh, termination of a bad migraine cycle, like I said, for status migranosis, sometimes I'll perform some blocks. But again, that's just going to break that particular cycle. There's not going to be a long-term benefit. Cluster we talked about. Uh, and again, if they happen to have pain in the office, I'll do a nerve block. Um, so peripheral nerve blocks can have central effects. In this study that Bill Young preferred, uh, performed at Jefferson, they actually uh, checked brush allodynia scores of patients outside of the occipital nerve distribution, so in the trigeminal distribution, and they found that both the allodynia scores improved as well as photophobia, which we all know is a central phenomenon from occipital nerve blocks. So there is evidence to show that there is a central activity. So as I was performing these occipital nerve blocks on patients with occipital neuralgia, I, I realized that the duration of benefit was significantly longer than what I ever anticipated. Uh, there were patients who would come back for their two-month, six-month, one-year, two-year follow-up, and they would say, um, yes, I'm, I'm still having migraines. The medications you gave me are working quite effectively. But when I'd ask about that shooting, stabbing pain and their neck pain, they would say, oh, ever since you did that injection, I have not had any further pain of that nature. So when we looked at this, we had 41 subjects who basically this was a retrospective review of that larger prevalence study that we did. And again, the number 41 came from subjects that really fulfilled all the data points that we were looking for. And so these patients received six cc's of uh, bupivacaine. And at the time, I followed the technique that, would, that was done at Mayo Clinic. So I did include triamcinolone in those injections. And uh, the average age of these patients was 45. The BMI was 28.19. And the diagnosis, six out of the 41 had isolated occipital neuralgia, while the other 35 had a comorbid diagnosis, mostly chronic migraine. And of them, 29 had bilateral occipital neuralgia, while five had right-sided and nine had left-sided. So what we looked at is um, response to treatment. And we defined a positive response to treatment to a complete absence of that lancinating occipital neuralgia pain. And so out of these 41 subjects, there was an average duration of benefit of 206 days. And again, that's the duration of benefit, uh, the average in this group. Uh, the range was as little as four days, unfortunately, and as high as 840 days. Um, and again, this is an underestimate because this is just based on chart review of their follow-up appointments. So again, I seriously doubt any of these patients came in for their appointment said, I haven't had a lancinating pain attack. And then the next day the pain came. Um, so again, these are significant underestimates. And so, you know, based on these results, uh, you know, a couple of things came to light, you know, one question was, why are these nerve blocks lasting so long? And the theory that we proposed and, and published on is that uh, that large volume, if this is your skull and this is your scalp, you're doing an injection which actually tents the skin and causes a hydrodissection of some of the muscle and connective tissue that's compressing the nerve. Um, and so after that hydrodissection, sometimes that, that nerve just never returns to that level of irritation. And so the name of this abstract was one and done, the remission of occipital neuralgia after large volume nerve blocks. So that manuscript were still pending publication. We have to get that published, but it was presented at both the American Academy of Neurology and the American Headache Society annual meetings. So this is the poster that we, we published. And just to zoom in on this image, this is from a book chapter that I wrote for the Harvard Pain Manual. Uh, so for this procedure, the red lines, um, there's the inion in the middle and the mastoid on the lateral side of that red line. I enter through the red oval, which is um, the entry point for the needle. I use a pretty big needle because it is a big volume. So I use a two inch 21 gauge needle. So I'll enter through that dot drop off the lateral portion, three cc's, exit, re-enter through the same entry point, and drop off another three cc's medially. Now, you might be wondering why this technique, if somebody presents with greater occipital uh, neuralgia or if they present with lesser occipital neuralgia, the reason is cadaver studies have actually demonstrated that the courses of these nerves are highly variable. So again, if somebody has a greater and lesser branch, which is more medial or more lateral, if you go purely based on the inion mastoid and the occipital notch, uh, you may not even end up getting the nerves that you're looking for. So this kind of blanket approach, in, which causes a goose egg on the back of the person's uh, occiput, you're almost guaranteed to get both the greater, lesser, and potentially even parts of the third nerve. 
And again, um, by blanketing all three of those nerves, you are more likely to uh, address the problem, whether it's the greater or lesser occipital nerve on that side. So how do you treat refractory occipital neuralgia where they've had anticonvulsants, tricyclics, large volume peripheral nerve blocks, cervical branch blocks, radiofrequency ablation, stimulator placement, and external occipular nerve stimulation? You know, th this is a question that, you know, fortunately of the thousands and thousands of patients that I've treated with occipital neuralgia, only 25 went through all of this. And before I actually, you know, go to the next slide, I also want to say, be very, very careful when patients say that I have tried occipital nerve blocks, those didn't work for me. Volume, as I mentioned, is very, very important. So the problem that often happens is someone will do a half a cc or one cc occipital nerve block. It doesn't work for the patient or it doesn't give them long lasting relief. And then what ends up in the patient's chart? Patient did not respond to occipital nerve blocks. And then unfortunately, uh, any physician or dentist that sees the patient thereafter will say, well, they didn't respond to occipital nerve blocks. I'm not going to bother trying. Um, so rather, I turn the conversation and I tell the patient, you know, there are many different techniques, different medications, so on and so forth. Why don't we try it one more time? And 100% uh, of the time, the patient says, you know, that felt very different uh, and it seemed to work better. Um, so, you know, as we're often taught, don't go by what's in the record, go by what the patient says, the history. And if you can get your hands on the procedure, no, great. But even if you can't, it's very worthwhile to try, attempt the procedure again using a different technique. So what do you do in patients who have failed all of these different treatments? Um, so there is something called migraine uh, deactivation surgery, uh, which you know I think is not the best name for these procedures. What they're doing is they're actually decompressing some of these peripheral cranial nerves, which are irritated. And my sense with this literature is that the success stories that they're encountering are in fact people with migraine and occipital neuralgia or some other focal neuralgia, not people with garden variety migraine. Because uh, again, as we all know, uh, migraine is not due to compression of a particular nerve, but it's a central disorder of the central nervous system and decompression of a particular nerve shouldn't really treat migraine. On the other hand, if it's somebody who has migraine and one of these focal neuralgias like occipital neuralgia uh, that is not responsive to large volume nerve blocks or medications, this is a viable option. So. Uh, with occipital nerve decompression surgery, uh, these are generally performed by a plastic surgeon, uh, not really a neurosurgeon. Uh, so what they do is they make an incision in the midline in the occiput. Uh, they'll resect a small piece of the semispinalis capitis muscle, and then they'll locate the nerve and actually remove some of the fascia and any other entwined tissue that's wrapped around it, then pat it with a fat pad and close everything back up. So it's a nerve sparing procedure. If when they do the dissection, they find that the occipital uh, artery is compressing the nerve, sometimes they will also ligate or resect the artery. And so um, this is one of my patients that I scrubbed in for the procedure. And it was quite amazing um, when they opened up uh, the occiput, the nerve had this very pale kind of choked color. And then with removal of some of this connective tissue and muscle that was wrapped around the nerve, um, the nerve almost appeared like it was revascularized. And so of the 25 patients that I've referred for surgery, nobody has regretted it. Um, they have all had varying degrees of improvement. Um, many patients are able to uh, not only experience a remission of their occipital neuralgia, but their migraines get significantly better as well. And again, this is not a cure for migraine, but if you remove that irritant occipital neuralgia, the migraines also tend to improve. So again, as I had mentioned, um, some surgeons do call this migraine surgery. Um, and so some of the pushback I've gotten from some of the plastic surgeons when I've suggested that the patient has migraine and a separate focal neuralgia is that, you know, one patient can have two different diagnoses. And obviously that can, that's not true. Um, that would be like saying someone uh, has migraine and a uh, temporomandibular disorder. Obviously, many of our patients have the two, and they do tend to irritate each other and cause each other to flare. And occipital neuralgia and migraine is no different. Um, the example I have here is like someone having carpal tunnel syndrome and cervical radiculopathy. Um, certainly, that exists, and I see it actually quite a bit in patients who have cervical radiculopathy. So another study that was published in the plastic surgery literature uh, talked about um, the use of Dopplers um, to find if there's a Doppler pulsation near the area where there's pain. And if they do find a Doppler pulse in that area, then that patient 
may that would make the patient a good surgical candidate. And you know, this didn't sit well with me either because, as all of you know, you have uh, arteries all over the body, and finding a Doppler signal should not be an indication of surgical candidacy, uh, just because you have Doppler signals all over the body. And it made me think of the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger and this line that he said, uh, "If it bleeds, we can kill it." Um, so certainly, uh, finding a Doppler signal should not be the push that someone's a good surgical candidate. Um, this is not just my um, sentiment. The American Headache Society back in 2012, when these procedures started to become more and more common for the treatment of migraine, they issued this position statement uh, declaring that uh, anybody who does proceed with surgery should be uh, in a well-organized trial where neurologists are involved and it's you know properly uh, done with the placebo group and so on and so forth. And uh, to date, the vast majority, if not all of the literature purporting these procedures for migraine is in the plastic surgery literature, not in any of the neurology or headache literature. So we as um, kind of the guardians of, of pain, and we're the ones usually that refer people for surgical procedures, uh, neurologists, and this should also say dentists, have a duty to influence behavior of our plastic surgery colleagues. Uh, we certainly should not operate on patients who have not had best medical management, especially if they have an episodic headache disorder, not a chronic headache disorder. Um, there should only be operations in areas where there's clear neuralgia form pain that respects the boundaries of a particular nerve. And again, the guidance of a knowledgeable neurologist, headache specialist, or orofacial pain specialist can really help guide people, not just for these types of nerve decompression surgeries, but any surgeries. Uh, Dr. Caspo has a comment here. Um, the surgeon you work with seems to be a cut above the rest. Uh, very nice. Dr. Romero Reyes, who many of you know, there, there must be a surgeon referrals to see you guys. And then finally, Dr. Austin, who's the plastic surgeon who I work with, who's the chair of plastic surgery at Mass General Hospital. Uh, geez, enough with the bad surgery puns. Please don't quit your day jobs. So we're now going to move on to the final circle of our Venn diagram. And this is uh, migraine and cervicalgia. So most of you know the pathophysiology of migraine, but very quickly, uh, one in five women have migraine, one in 20 men have migraine. There's a strong genetic predisposition. And that then leads to cortical neuronal hyperexcitability, um, cortical spreading depression, activation of the peripheral uh, nervous system and the trigeminal vascular system, neurogenic inflammation, central sensitization, and then eventually the uh, migraine headache comes on. And central sensitization, as all of you know, includes photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, osmophobia. Th those are some of the more common ones. But really the way to think about central sensitization is that it is an amplification of sensory inputs. So kinesiophobia, movement really being irritating, some would argue is that the movement of the meninges that are in an inflammatory state, uh, possibly. Dizziness or vertigo. And again, my sense is that the semicircular canals are sending a normal signal to the central nervous system, but the central sensitized brain is now taking that signal and amplifying it into vertigo. And cutaneous allodynia, another manifestation of central sensitization. And then finally, uh, afferent signals that are being sent from joints and muscles. And this will be the crux of what we're, we're going to talk about for migraine and cervicalgia. So cutaneous allodynia, I just want to touch on quickly, just because this is a subject that I studied a little bit when I was at Mayo Clinic. We did a study of patients with chronic migraine, and we found that well over 90% of patients with chronic migraine have some degree of cutaneous allodynia. And as I had mentioned earlier, uh, neurologists do enjoy nerdy puns. So the title of this paper was A Touchy Subject, An Assessment of Cutaneous Allodynia in Chronic Migraine pop Population. So many of you have probably seen this chart or a chart that looks like it, where it goes over the premonitory phase, the headache phase, the resolution, the postrum, the dashed yellow line is the sensory hyperexcitability, central sensitization. The red line is the headache phase where um, when it picks up to the peak points there, it's that throbbing, pounding, but before and after, it can be more of that dull pressure. And that's why patients get very confused. They say, I have tension type headache and I have migraine. And I very quickly jump in and say, no, no, you have low grade migraine, which if you don't treat it, or if you subject yourself to more triggers, it is going to escalate to the throbbing, pounding, disabling pain of migraine. And then aura is that blue tube that you see on the screen. Again, this can occur during the early phase of a headache, but actually can also occur before a headache. Now, the modifications that I have made to this chart are the yellow and red boxes below. 
So within the ICTO event or during the migraine itself, as you can see with the yellow dash line of sensory hyperexcitability or central sensitivity, is where migrainous cervicalgia manifests. So these are patients that say, yeah, I really don't have neck pain, but every time I have a bad migraine, I have this horrible, horrible neck pain. So it only occurs ictally. And again, that's because of amplification of sensory inputs from their joints. They really don't have much significant neck pathology. They have some, maybe some mild DJ, the DJD that they do not even appreciate between attacks. But when the migraine comes on, that gets amplified and they have this horrible neck pain. On the other hand, in the red box below that is cervicogenic headache, as well as occipital neuralgia. So again, these are pains that occur between the ictal attacks. And again, when they are more prominent, they serve as a trigger for a migraine. And that's why you see that red bar extending outside of that migraine cycle. So is neck pain a migraine symptom? So one study that was done they looked at 487 subjects with episodic migraine, 73% female, 77% had migraine without aura. And of them, 338 reported neck pain of some kind during the migraine phase. So that's about 70% of patients present with neck pain during their migraine. So 184 uh, noticed that the neck pain at the onset of a headache, and again, headache starts, neck pain starts, that's probably migraine cervicalgia. And then group B, or the second group, 118 patients, they reported neck pain within two hours before the headache phase. So could that be part of the prodrome? Uh, could that be cervical pathology that's manifesting before? Either could be the case. Uh, group B had a higher proportion of typical migraine-associated symptoms, and neck pain progressed into the headache phase in about 82%. So again, even those patients that had some degree of neck pain before the headache onset, it worsened during the headache, which again emphasizes how there's sen sensory amplification and this pain becomes more and more intense. So the bottom line is neck pain is a very common feature of a migraine attack and is more likely to be part of the migraine attack rather than a po prodrome in patients where it seems to be an ictal event. So migraine cervicalgia, you know, Again, this is a pain that's exclusively ictal. Uh, the neck pain typically is proportional to the headache. So as the headache pain gets worse, the neck pain also gets worse. Between migraine attacks, uh, passive range of motion, active range of motion, contact, none of these things really exacerbate the neck pain because, again, they're not sensitized between attacks. They typically have a benign neurological examination. Physical modalities like stretching, massage, really provide little improvement of this neck pain because, again, it's an ictal event. And rather than imaging and other studies, empiric treatment is warranted. So um, I'm just looking at the time. I have three cases. I think I can quickly run through them. Uh, and so we'll still have some time for Q&A. So uh, I'm going to just kind of sprint through these because they do illustrate uh, what we've been talking about. So case number one, a 40-year-old woman presents to the office with headache, history of infrequent but severe headaches since the age of 14, holocephalic, throbbing, 8 out of 10 pain, uh, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting. So again, this sounds very much like somebody with migraine. And then about 10 years ago, the headache started to become more frequent, more severe. Uh, she denies any trauma, illness, or any other triggering events. Uh, currently, she has daily headaches. Triptans, amitriptyline, topiramate have helped to some extent, but have not taken this pain away. So on physical examination, it is unremarkable except for a Tenel sign that she has over the right occiput. What other questions do you want to ask? If we were in person, I'd call on different people, um, but I'll jump ahead. Uh, does head turning or contact trigger this pain? Uh, is chronic neck pain and stiffness also an issue for you? They'll usually say yes. What do you do for a living? Uh, what are your hobbies? Again, occupations or repetitive activities may flare this even further. Uh, have you ever seen physical therapy? And is exercise or stretching part of your daily or weekly routines? So what diagnostic study would you do? Again, if we were live, I'd pick on somebody in the audience and they would very wisely say a right occipital nerve block. And two months later, this patient comes back, that lancinating pain in the occiput and the neck pain have resolved completely. Uh, the headache frequency rather than daily is now down to 10 headache days per month. Uh, the patient is able to wean off of topiramate with ongoing stability. And uh, the headaches that she does have 10 days per month are much more responsive to migraine specific agents that were previously ineffective, including sumatriptan. So again, this is someone who had episodic migraine, developed occipital neuralgia, got the blocks, neuralgia is under control. Now, the previously 
less effective migraine treatments are now effective because you're removing that stimulus. Case number two, a 65-year-old man presents to the office with headache, history of infrequent and moderate headaches since the age of 22. Uh, these are holocephalic, but they have more of a pressing quality with at worst a four out of 10 intensity, no photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, or vomiting. And again, I would call out to the audience, what do you think this gentleman has? As someone would wisely say, it sounds like he has had episodic tension type headache for most of his life. And they would be correct. And then about five years ago, the headache started to become much more frequent, much more severe. Uh, he denies any trauma, illness, or other any other events that uh, occurred five years ago at the worsening of these headaches. Currently, he has daily headaches and neck pain. Um, he also notes recently tripping and falling twice. Uh, ibuprofen was initially effective but has lost its potency. And with both of those trip and fall events, no neck injury, no head trauma. So on physical examination... He has limited range of motion in the neck with pain at end stage and diffuse hyperreflexia right greater than left with a positive Hoffman sign on the right. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with a Hoffman sign, uh, many of you may be familiar with the Babinski. I'm not going to pick my foot up and show you on the screen, but basically you stroke the bottom of the foot with the sharp end of the tuning fork and the toes flare up and out. That That is a primitive response, which shows uh, an upper um, lower motor neuron injury. Uh, and so the same thing uh, can happen with a Hoffman response. Uh, basically, when you flick the finger, it does kind of a movement like this and it claws. And so that's kind of the upper extremity um, equivalent to a uh, Babinski in the lower extremity. So this guy had hyperreflexia on the right and a Hoffman sign. So what other questions do you want to ask? Um, those very similar questions can be asked. And again, these questions are not necessarily part of my routine history and physical. Uh, uh, sorry, part of my routine history. But when I do find physical exam findings, then sometimes that'll lead to these questions being asked. So what diagnostic study would you like to do? So again, in an older guy who has new onset neck pain and is now tripping uh, quite a bit, fell twice and has hyperreflexia on one side, you have to think, is there something going on in the cervical spine? So MRI of the cervical spine demonstrated this finding. As many of you can see, this is a surgical emergency. This guy has a string sign in his cervical spine, meaning um, very, very severe cervical stenosis. Literally, this is a game of millimeters. If this guy gets pushed in the right direction, he can become paraplegic. So the MRI is completed, read urgently, doctor's paged, doctor tells the patient, proceed carefully to the emergency department for an urgent neurosurgical consultation. He's admitted, decompressed that day. Two months later, he comes back for follow-up uh, after the critical stenosis and imaging study is done. He had a laminectomy infusion. Uh, the neck stiffness and pain has improved significantly. His headaches went from daily to five days per month with tension type features. Again, he reverted back to his previous phenotype and he's no longer tripping because that was decompressed. Finally, the last case, 25-year-old woman who comes to the office complaining of headache, a uh, history of infrequent but severe headaches since the age of 14. Again, hollow cephalic, throbbing, pounding, photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, vomiting. Again, I would turn to the audience and everybody would say this young lady has migraine and they would be correct. And then about a year ago after starting residency, uh, the headache started to become much more frequent, much more intense. She denies any trauma, illness, or any other triggering events. And currently, she has daily headaches with near-daily neck pain as well. Again, daily headache, near-daily neck pain. Triptans and NSAIDs have helped, but the pain always returns. Her physical examination was unremarkable. Um, and so what other questions do you want to ask? Uh, you guys are, are very observant, uh, and so you may not be surprised to see the same questions are here. So a young lady who has now daily headache and daily neck pain, and previously before the daily headaches did not have uh, significant neck pain. So what diagnostic study would you recommend? Uh, well, many of you are probably thinking, well, we already covered occipital neuralgia. We already covered a cervical, uh, a cervicogenic headache case. So this must be a migraine or cervicalgia case. And your instincts would serve you correctly as you are ready to take a board exam because you're all expert test takers. And so um, the diagnostic study here would be to put the patient on an effective migraine preventative treatment. So two months uh, after follow-up, the patient is started on galconezumab, which is one of the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, 
Her headache frequency improves significantly from daily to three to five days per month. And again, the big stressor for her was starting residency, and that's probably what triggered the migraines to occur more frequently. And again, her neck pain occurs less than once a month and only with her most severe headache. So again, daily headache on galcanezumab becomes three to five days per month. And only one of those days, which is a severe migraine, involves neck pain of any kind. So she discontinued the chronic massage therapies she was receiving because, again, her neck was fine. It was all migraine and cervicalgia. So uh, to wrap up, and it looks like we're doing pretty good on time, um, there are many treatments for these conditions. Uh, medication trials, as all of you know, should start low and titration should be slow based on patient preferences and side effects. I personally tell the patient, ignore the weekly increases on the prescription, but rather move at your own pace. If you start amitriptyline, for example, let them sit at 20 for as long as they want. And if they feel like they need to, and if they're not having any side effects, they can certainly continue the titration on their own. Uh, do not hesitate to refer the patient to another provider for treatments that you may not provide. So if you strongly think this person has occipital neuralgia, reach out to a pain doctor, neurologist, headache specialist in your area that performs occipital neuroblocks if you do not perform them yourself. Uh, combination therapies are typically the most effective. Uh, when I have a patient who has occipital neuralgia, I will recommend uh, physical therapy, uh, nerve blocks, as well as medications. So it's kind of a trifecta approach. And what I tell patients is, if you get a nerve block and your pain is in remission, fantastic. Uh, let's do these routine stretches for your neck to really keep the pain away. Um, that's the same advice I tell patients who get the spinal injections for lumbar radiculopathy or whatever it is. The interventions we do, we should really tell patients, this is a way to help get your pain under better control, but really practicing good posture, good stretching, all the kind of lifestyle things that we recommend is really the way to keep that pain from coming back. And as I've mentioned, failure of nerve blocks in the chart does not mean failure of nerve blocks in reality. Uh, technique, volume, all these things are very important. And AHS has issued a position statement on migraine surgery for a reason. So do be very cautious and certainly advise your patients at least failure of best medical management should be considered before even thinking about surgery of any kind. So I'm happy to take questions. Um, Dr. Bender has a question. We'll start with him. Um, what volume do you use for occipital nerve blocks? Uh, Dr. Burke, I don't know if he's on the line. He's uh, the current American Headache Society um, Temporomandibular Dysfunction Section Chair. Uh, let's see what he has to say. Uh, volume, the best volume setting for Dr. Matthews. Mute. <laughs> Very clever, Dr. Burke. Uh, and then finally, my pitch, uh, please consider attending the American Headache Society Scottsdale Symposium. Um, I'm going to be running the cadaver course. I believe it's already sold out. Uh, but it is a fantastic course where we really reinforce the importance of understanding the anatomy, the structure, and the function, which really helps us to understand not only the pathology, but why we do what we do when we perform procedures in terms of technique, injections, medication, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Paul, for a great uh, presentation and great slides. Uh, we love it. Um, and um, we have a few questions. Uh, Connor, if you want to start uh, with the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like Gabby said, just to piggyback, piggyback thank you so much for the uh, the talk uh, and the um, the comedy uh, sprinkled in as well. So first question. Yeah, Gabby is, knows I cut down on a lot of the cat comedy because I didn't want to run over time. So uh, <laughs> usually there's more. Well, we, got, we got plenty of good ones in there. So uh, first question is if an occipital neuralgia can set off a migraine. Would treating the occipital neuralgia prevent migraine in these patients or would migraine arise on its own regardless? Yeah. So again, most of these people have a genetic predisposition for migraine. So eliminating occipital neuralgia should kind of fall into the same bucket as triggers. And when I talk about triggers, I use this visual. If this is where you start your day and this is what you need for a disabling migraine, if you didn't sleep all the night before you start your day here, and then if you're under more stress, if there's weather fluctuations, there's hormonal fluctuations, your occipital neuralgia is acting up, boom, you'll get a full-blown migraine. So really, occipital neuralgia should be considered a trigger of migraine, and it does work in concert with the other triggers. And triggers are things that will make it more likely that you're going to have a migraine. So unfortunately, for many of these patients, if you're having daily occipital neuralgia attacks, that's just further prompting the migraine. And for many of these patients, if you give them a triptan, they will say, yeah, that throbbing, pounding part of my headache pain got better, 
the light and sound sensitivity got better, but it did not touch the pain in the back of my neck. Because again, that pathology does not respond to triptans and other migraine specific medications. Okay. Um, next question is in occipital neuralgia, is the nerve being irritated by the suboccipital and cervical musculature and fascia? Or is it more of a compression force due to upper cervical and cranial extension from positioning um, and posture? And then the follow-up would be, if, if it's more muscular, uh, have, have you seen benefit in, in dry needling in terms of providing similar short-term diagnostic data? Yeah. So like I said, when I, when I have a patient like this, I will typically do a nerve block to kind of break the cycle. And then I will certainly encourage stretching as well. The problem with occipital neuralgia, and I, I kick myself for this, I actually did an MRI study looking at the occipital nerve in dynamic positions. I still have to publish it. And do you know what it showed for people with occipital neuralgia? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. It looked like just completely normal nerve. So the problem really becomes where is the pain? Is it as it exits the radicals? Is it in the neck? Is it in the occiput? And so that's why it's very useful to use this blanket approach. Sometimes I will also do some large volume trigger point injections along where the course of the nerve is. Because again, where exactly that pain is along the course of the nerve, it's difficult to say. And so when we talk about where the pathology is, I think it makes perfect sense um, to do stretches involving both the neck, the occiput. The two I particularly recommend, there, there's the bird watcher stretch which you go into extension and then while you're in extension you are rotating and then the tuck and tilt which you go into retraction and then you do some lateral flexion those really really open up the radicals both for occipital neuralgia but also for cervical radiculopathy um, so yeah pinpointing is really a problem and so a blanket approach you know with many of these patients i'll put them on an anticonvulsant do their nerve block educate them on stretching and then i'll send them out that way there's kind of a a threefold approach and then when they come back if the pain's under good control then i'll slowly wean them off the medication but remind them you need to continue your stretching um i need to ask a question um uh, to second uh, dr bender uh, you talked about or he asked <laughs> what volume uh, do you use for occipital nerve plants now let's say and i know you said six uh, uh CC lidocaine and 20 uh, milligram 3 MSL alone. Now, does it happen that like you do it bilaterally or just unilaterally? So a, a couple thoughts there. So first of all, when, when we did that study, that was the technique that Mayo was doing at the pain clinic. I don't really use triamcinolone anymore. I only use bupivacaine because again, the thought is I'm not treating inflammation but rather I'm causing that volume expansion or that hydrodissection. Uh, I do not do this procedure bilaterally in a single session because that is a very big, big volume. Um, so trying to put 12 cc's in someone's head <laughs> in one sitting, even if they have bilateral symptoms, I'll always ask them which side is worse and I'll do one side. And then a couple of weeks later, I'll have them come back and do the other side. Um, follow up question. How often do you repeat at the same side? So it depends. Um, generally, patients, when I do a nerve block, um, if they get the pain back within a day or two, I I generally do not pursue another nerve block because I think it's probably just not amenable to that hydrodissection. If they come back like two months later and they say it started to gradually come back, I'll actually do it again and sometimes do a little bit more volume as they can tolerate. Uh, if they really have trouble tolerating the procedure, I'll actually do the same volume again because again, Depending on where you put your needle, you might actually stretch different areas. And with each time, they may get a little bit more stretch. Most of my patients, when I do go in and do it the second time, it's not nearly as painful because already that area is a little dissected. But, but yeah, like I said, um, you know, with these patients, it's a big volume. So I will, across the board, have them hang out in the office for at least 15 to 20 minutes. Um, just to let them relax, recover, and then they can go on their own. Um, many of these patients, after six cc's, when you stand them up, they feel very dizzy, very lightheaded. So it's very important to keep an eye on them. And that's why I, I do not recommend bilateral simultaneous procedures, just because just doing one side is enough in terms of those side effects. And you mentioned you put them on an anticonvulsant first. Is there one that you prefer for occipital neuralgia? And if you know, if you're putting them on prior to the injections, do you do it a certain amount of time before you start with injecting them? So it, it all depends on the patient. 
Uh, I mean, after I explained the procedure and everything, many patients who are medication averse say, you know, I don't want to start medication. I say, you know, what, let's do this. I'm going to send the prescription in. If you notice that pain just doesn't come back, obviously don't fill the prescription. If you notice within a couple of weeks, you notice the pain starting to come back, certainly you can start it then. Uh, if I'm primarily targeting occipital neuralgia, many of these patients will have just horrible sleep just because they have trouble falling asleep because of the occipital neuralgia. So I, I like gabapentin. Um, I'll do nightly dosing of it just to really help them fall asleep, stay asleep, curb some of the neuralgia. Um, if not that, I mean, tricyclics can be useful as well for the same reason. Um, the other thing I sometimes do is I will put them on something a little bit more migraine specific as well, because if I think that the occipital nerve block is going to work well, I'll do that for their occipital neuralgia, then I'll put them on like topiramate or something like that for migraine prevention. Um, that way you kind of hit both sides. Uh, and of course, anybody with migraine also gets acute treatments, right? So I typically send somebody out with a with an anti-emetic if they have nausea, uh, an NSAID, as well as a triptan, or if they've been through triptans, I'll put them on a G-pan like Dubrojapant or uh, Remenjapant. Okay. Um, a few more technique-specific questions. If you have a couple more minutes um, related to the greater occipital nerve blocks, um, one is do you do ice prior to the injection and is do you have any recommendations as far as needle angulation in relation to the skull yeah so um i don't ice before uh, i don't think that's a problem but I, I typically don't um with any injection the slower that you inject the less painful it's going to be um so a lot of the time i will just very slowly inject small aliquots of medication along the line and then as i'm withdrawing i'll drop off a larger volume and also, since this is by the occipital artery, before you inject, you definitely want to pull back, especially if you're using steroid. I generally don't use steroid anymore for occipital neuralgia, but the last thing you want to do is to go intravascular with a particulate steroid. Um, so definitely before you do any injecting, you want to pull back, make sure you know, go, don't get any blood in the plunger, uh, in, in the syringe, and then you inject. Um, and again, the, the slower you go, the less painful it's going to be. In, and I think dropping off that load as you're pulling out makes sense. In terms of the angle, um, I typically do like a 45 degree angle. You want to be very careful. As you know, your skull is not flat. There is a slight curvature to it. And if you're at the wrong angle, that needle will actually come out the other side of the skin. And now you've just made a hole for the medication to come out of. Um, so yeah, you definitely want to be conscious of that. When I inject, I will actually use my non-injection hand when I'm injecting and I'll feel where the rise of the skin is and that'll tell me exactly where the tip of the needle is. And so I'll continue that till I get a rise right by the mastoid and then that tells me, okay, don't advance any further, pull out and drop off that load. And then I turn around and go in the other direction towards the Indian, kind of following the same process. So again, feeling where that rises will tell you exactly where your needle tip is. And you're relatively safe as long as you're on skull base, right? Because Generally, the skull base is protecting you from the brain, from any large vascular structures or anything like that. If you're ever below the, the skull base, that's when you might be in trouble because there's a lot of delicate structures in the neck that you have to worry about. Sure. Okay. Um, maybe our last question, just for time, um, there's a few more good ones, I think. But uh, one that just came in is uh, related to your, your comment on the uh, trigger point injections. You said sometimes you perform a trigger point injection. Um, so what, if any, is the role that myofascial pain uh, plays in these cases? And how do we rule that out before coming to uh, one of the other diagnoses, including neuralgia? Yeah, so I called it a trigger point injection in name only. Um, basically, it's, it's again, a large volume injection where you perceive that nerve running where the tunnel sign is registering. So uh, a trigger point is kind of a misnomer on my part. I mean, some people would call it a suboccipital block, but I would be very, very careful doing that. If you don't have any experience, you've never watched anyone do it, I definitely would not jump in to stick a needle in someone's neck, especially with some of the deeper structures. I think if you're on the skull base, you'll be relatively safe. Also, one other thing I did want to mention, if you do end up doing any large volume injections, warn the patient. Um, some patients, because of that stretch effect, will have some soreness in the area lasting a couple of days or a week. I do tell people if you have any of that, a bag of frozen peas or some ice, that is usually fine. And most patients, they've actually told me, I was very mad at you for the, you know, a couple of days after the procedure for a week. But when that stretch pain went away and I didn't have any of the neuralgia, I realized it was well worth it. Interesting. Yeah, I wasn't aware of the uh, the volume effects. So I, that was definitely a, a good takeaway for me. Um, so I don't know, uh, 
Gabby, if we have time for more questions or if you have any closing remarks. It's, uh, I'll do the closing remark, but it's up to Paul if he will take another question or... Um, yeah, why don't, we'll take one more if... if uh, okay. Um, okay with me. So one that I think uh, came in a little bit earlier is a little, again, a little bit more uh, unique and specific, but in a patient with pre-existing a uh, pre-existing diagnosis of Chiari malformation, how would this affect uh, your diagnosis and treatment? Yeah, so I mean, if it, well, first you have to decide is is it a symptomatic Chiari malformation, right? Uh, fortunately, our neurosurgery colleagues are operating less and less on inappropriate Chiari cases. Um, so, you know, patients often will see that and run with it and say, well, I need to have surgery, which is often not the case. And again, the structures we're talking about are, are more superficial. So certainly someone can, I've had patients who have had a Chiari one and occipital neuralgia. So these diagnoses are not exclusive from each other. And I've certainly performed nerve blocks in these patients with good results. Um, and so the Chiari malformation ends up being just an incident loma in these cases. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, we have a few questions specifically about, you know, exercises that we can, we can send patients home with in our practice as, you know, means of stretching out those, um, you know, posterior cervical and occipital muscles. I know you alluded to some earlier. Um, so I think you kind of helped answer those for us already. Is there a, maybe more specifically a, a frequency that you typically will recommend your patients perform those exercises at home? Yeah. So those exercises literally take seconds to do. So I tell my patients, you know, I'd rather do a um, lifestyle prescription than a medication prescription. So rather than saying three times a day, I tell them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you sit down to eat, you do your two neck stretches, you enjoy your meal. And, you know, the important thing to emphasize with all stretches is you want to move to the point that it's a little tight, a little uncomfortable, not painful. You don't want to force a joint to move in a way that it's not supposed to, because with time, that range of motion will come. Um, but some patients, you know, really wrench their neck thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to fix this. And again, that just leads to worse pain. And the other thing we need to reinforce to our patients is if a stretch is uncomfortable, even a little painful, unfortunately, that's the stretch that needs to be done, right? Because that's the structure that's really tight and causing a lot of the symptoms. Commonly, people with neck pain, what do they say? Oh, I, I do this and I do this and it feels so good. And I tell them, well, it feels so good because you're constantly like this anyway, whether you're texting, typing, eating, you're in this anterior position. So your neck is so used to that position that that feels good and it's comfortable. Nobody other than maybe some uh, ornithologists who are on the line here do this movement, right? It, it, we, ju we just don't do it in our everyday life. It's uncomfortable. It's even painful for some patients. And this is where you really have to reinforce, do it slowly, do it gently, move to the point where it's a little tight, uncomfortable, not painful. And the other thing, which I'm sure all of you do, whenever you send a patient, please, to physical therapy, you tell them, listen, you may feel a little better during the sessions, but the most important thing is they're going to give you some homework. And you need to do that homework. And weeks to months later after your last physical therapy session is where you're really going to see the benefit. They're not going to fix anything. They're going to give you the cookbook to make the delicious meal, which will show up months later from being, um, you know, really complying with what they recommend. Great. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for really this wonderful uh, presentation. And I want to thank uh, Connor for uh, helping here. Uh, I want to thank everyone who attended this uh, uh, webinar and who's still with us. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And uh, a reminder about our next uh, meeting is on Saturday, November the 4th for a sleep review. Uh, stay tuned for additional information. Um, and uh, you will get uh, CE uh, credit for this, this meeting uh, very soon. Uh, thank you again, Paul. Uh, as usual, one uh, great presentation, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next month with the mustache only. Exactly. Yeah. No. And I, I encourage all of you, if you have not been to the American Headache Society meeting, particularly the Scottsdale Headache Symposium, please come. Uh, there's a, as Gabby knows, a very, very active TMD section. I come to all the section meetings. It's a great opportunity for. Uh, neurologist, headache specialists, and dentists and orofacial pain specialists to really have some excellent crosstalk. So I, I look forward to hopefully meeting all of you at some point. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Thanks, Thanks again. Paul.